Professor Stanley E. Gontarski specializes in 20th century Irish studies in British, US, and European modernism and in performance theory. He is a leading scholar of the work of Samuel Beckett and is the Robert O. Lawton Distinguished Professor of English at Florida State University. He has been awarded four National Endowment for the Humanities Research Grants, has twice been awarded Fulbright Professorships, has been guest editor of the following. American Book Review, The Review of Contemporary Fiction and Modern Fiction Studies. He is also general editor of four book series, including Anthem Studies in Theatre and Performance with Anthem Press London and other Beckett's from Edinburgh University Press. He has edited numerous volumes, such as The Theatrical Notebooks of Samuel Beckett, Modernism, Censorship and the Politics of Publishing, The Faber Companion to Samuel Beckett and written multiple books like The Intent of Undoing in Samuel Beckett's Grammatic Text and Creative Involution, Bergson, Beckett, Dillers. Some of his most recent authored books include Burroughs Unbound, William Burroughs and the Performance of Writing, Tennis Williams, T-shirt Modernism and the Refashioning of Theatre, and Revisioning, uh, Revisioning Beckett, Samuel Beckett's Decadent Turn. Yeah, so now I request Professor Gondarsky to begin his talk. Thank you. Nice job, Peril. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome uh, all. I hope I'm not uh, delaying your dinner. Uh, my guess is that it may be dinner time uh, in Calcutta. But apologies if I am doing that. Uh, the, the only compensation is uh, I've not had my breakfast yet. So uh, we are both waiting for uh, our daily bread. Um, anyway, uh, Parle mentioned the uh, William Burroughs book, uh, which is coming out in uh, December from um, Bloomsburg. And uh, that would probably be um, among the most radical examples of avant-gardism um, in the 20th and now 21st uh, century. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about uh, theater uh, for the most part. Uh, but before I get to uh, modern uh, drama, uh, let, let me back up a little bit and, and talk about uh, art uh, generally. I think one of the things uh, we have been slow to recognize is that almost all art depends on a market, uh, interacts with, with commerce. Uh, becomes some point uh, a commodity. Uh, and there is a crucial point for creating art where their private labor enters a commodity market, a uh, commodity driven market. And that was not perhaps always the case. Uh, if we go back to the very beginnings, uh, those creatures who were drawing representations on the walls of their caves in Lascaux, France, uh, were, were probably not charging admission uh, for people to see their handiwork. Um, it was uh, probably more uh, a record of their achievements uh, that that they are here, uh, and we still see that uh, record. During the Second World War, the Allies were uh, fond of scribbling graffiti here and there, uh, mostly which said Kilroy was here. Uh, again, that was not a commercial enterprise, but putting forth uh, one's presence marking one's uh, presence. But most art at one way or one point or another, and most artists uh, one way or another uh, have to come to terms with uh, a commercial market. It's gotten a little crazy 
these days, uh, if you tape a banana to uh, a wall and offer it for sale, it can and has fetched a hundred thousand quid. Uh, presumably, after that purchase, uh, the buyer ate the banana. Uh, so, uh, what, what, one way or another, uh, that that seemed to be art without uh, a sort of eternal factor, uh, but one dealing with immediate satisfaction. Uh, it cost a thousand quid for that snack, but uh, evidently he had the money to spare. Uh, theater uh, is really no different. Uh, theater is almost always in search of an audience. Uh, it's in particular crisis now uh, because most commercial theaters have been closed for about two years and are slowly reopening. Um, and theater has been, you know, the last two decades losing its traditional audience, which is people of my age. Uh, and so there's been a desperate uh, hunt for a new audience for theater and whether or not theater can compete with other forms of performance. Uh, many of them are more readily accessible uh, on your uh, iPhone or uh, other smart uh, device. Uh, so that theater has been in crisis for a long time, all the more so now. And it'll be interesting to see if or how it will survive. But to get back to uh, modern uh, theater, uh, a couple of more things. One, uh, it's probably a mistake to think of modern theater as a monolith of some sort, as, as a single uh, entity. Uh, it has uh, diverged, fragmented uh, many times over the last century and a half uh, that it has been in uh, existence. And much of that as well has been a search for an audience of some sort or another. But, but the traditional uh, marking point of modern drama was the performance of Henrik Ibsen's uh, A Doll's House. Uh, and what was a striking about uh, Ibsen, particularly with a, a Doll's House, is a shift in the subject of theater to more or less everyday life everyday activity, a domestic scene, a marriage with some conflict. And it's part of a larger trend in the arts somewhere in the last two decades of the 19th century that the subject of art should be the rising middle class. They were the people who had um, available uh, recreational funds. And if you look at the visual arts as well, uh, what you see in the beginnings of impressionist art is the subject matter becoming the middle class at usually at leisure. Uh, picnics on the lawn, strolls along various kinds of islands in the Seine, Le Grand Jatte, uh, for example. Uh, these were artists celebrating middle-class life and, and they found uh, an audience uh, very quickly uh, amid a growing middle-class across uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, by the time you get a bit later in the 19th century, 
where Monet is uh, obsessed with the hole he dug in his backyard uh, and turned into a uh, garden, built a little Japanese bridge uh, across it and obsessively painted the, the same scene or 60 times. Uh, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden we have a new kind of modernism, an obsessive uh, modernism uh, at work. But the scenes mostly are still uh, middle class, you know, uh, an ideal sort of garden in the backyard of his uh, home uh, outside of Paris. Uh, in the town of Vantoy. Um, other artists would develop that in all sorts of ways. But the important thing for us is to see that art late in the 19th century was expanding to this uh, growing middle class that had uh, discretionary uh, uh, money and supported the art. Um, one curious feature, uh, some of those um, celebrations of middle class life also turned against the middle class. Uh, in A Doll's House, it is famously, the ending is famously discussed as a, a shot heard around the world or, or a slam of a door around the world as the wife, uh, Nora, famously breaks her ties to her husband and her life. I mean, it is a dramatic moment because a woman in 1880 didn't really have many options. Uh, she couldn't leave and go to work in a local uh, attorney's office or become a nurse or any of those features. She had nowhere to go. And so it was important for her, more important for her, just to leave this life where she was treated like a doll in a little doll's house and to break out into a larger world. There's no sequel to that play. Uh, some of us would li like to know how Nora uh, survived, but the play ends with that dramatic uh, action. For us, a couple of things are important. Uh, one, that we see this shift more and more toward everyday life, not heroic actions, uh, but images of everyday life in the common language uh, of, that, of that time. And from there, what we generally call modern drama explodes. The other important thing is not to consider modern drama as a monolithic entity, as a coherent uh, element. It begins to fragment uh, almost immediately. Strindberg would begin to write dream plays uh, and take that idea of the everyday in another uh, direction. But if we're looking for uh, tipping points in the development of theater, Ibsen and A Doll's House is one of them. The way in which, for example, uh, Picasso's uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon of 1907 is something of a tipping point away from Monet to even less uh, representational forms of, of art. I'd like to uh, pursue this theme of the everyday, uh, a theater of, of the everyday and how it progresses through the avant-garde. I have a paper to read uh, and it begin, begins 
with an epithet. And this is from UNESCO. And it says, the notion of entertainment is anti-theatrical. That is, it's not the function for UNESCO, it's not the function of theater, simply to entertain. It has other functions. He doesn't specify at that point what those functions are, but he has a whole host of plays which uh, demonstrate something of that uh, principle. So let me begin what is the, the formal uh, portion of my talk. It's divided into several parts and we'll see how much time we have. If I didn't take uh, so much time with an introduction, we might have gotten further uh, into this lecture. But uh, uh, this first part is called the, fudge, the fuzzy edges of contemporary theater. And what we're looking at is not, not only is drama and modern drama not a monolithic uh, entity, but its relationship to other genres, other human activities is not always clear. So I begin. Theater has always been something of a um, mercurial, if not chimeric, art, a hybrid form, an amalgam of ritual reenactments, performed beliefs, archival records, and human imagination, unstable and even pliable by definition, since its realization relies on a multiplicity of sources and facilitators coalescing under unstable, tenuous, often improvisational conditions. The result is usually a composite beast, a fusion of forms reconfigured in each iteration. Unsurprisingly then, what we call theater has what Richard Schechner calls blurry boundaries, or here, fuzzy edges. If edges, it has at all. Since edges, like boundaries, suggest demarcation, territory, borders, zones, a demean, a pale, that is limits. And the art of contemporary performance cuts across, runs through, is entangled with, bleeds into not only many other contemporary art forms, but intersects with and overlaps popular entertainment and everyday activity, religious and secular, so that the borders, distinctions, boundaries, or even generic separations are often indistinguishable, indistinguishable among acts, kinetic and performative activities. Moreover, such, um, moreover, much contemporary or alternative theater practice in particular develops in defiance of a mimetic tradition, the so-called realistic or illusionary threads of performative art with their emphasis on architectural and material validity. That's what we would see in an Ibsen production most often. Their focus, that is the realistic focus uh, on family constellations and commitments to simulations of epistemologically stable and familiar world. In his seminal book, Performance Studies and Introduction, Richard Schechner details what he sweepingly calls performing in everyday life with a string of examples of contemporary performative activity. Family, and this is Schechner, family and social roles, job roles, spectator sports, and other popular entertainments, performing arts, secular 
and sacred rituals, trance. That is what Schechner lays out is what we call theater, if we think of it in terms of performance, is very closely related to all these other activities, which have to do with various degrees of performance. If you think about such things, uh, you have to figure out how many different roles you play in your day-to-day -day activity. When you talk to your professor, are you a different person from when you talk to your friends or you talk to your family? We can recall T.S. Eliot talking about putting on a face to meet the faces that we meet. Uh, Eliot is talking about this performance uh, in, in a major part of everyday life. To paraphrase Heidegger, uh oh, here we go into uh, heavy philosophy. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Heidegger, uh, in uh, then a being in the world is a performance. Such issues entail and are complicated by ontological instability, the lack of something like pure discrete being. Quote, and this is uh, Schechner again. I may experience being beside myself, a very common expression, but when you say I'm beside myself, what are you beside? Um, are you all of a sudden a bifurcated uh, entity? So Schechner says, I may experience being beside myself, not myself, another very common phrase where we excuse ourselves by saying, well, I, I was just not myself. Yeah, well, what were you? Or who were you? Uh, and the like. Or taken over. Uh, when we are taken over, as in a trance, or other kinds of mystical experiences. The fact that there are multiple me's in every person is not a sign of derangement, but the way things are. The enactment or performance of such cultural multiplicity and ontological instability is often presented through a composite of means, what Richard Castellanitz will call theater, theater of mixed means. Early in the era that we generally call modernist, and it's often important to distinguish uh, between modern, which is a very broad term, often a synonym for contemporary. So anything, any artwork uh, of today might be deemed modern and modernist, uh, which tends to be a mode of artistic creation. I join those people who refuse to call modernism a period uh, because that suggests it has a termination. Uh, and at least the most advanced scholarship these days tends to talk about modernism as a continuing unfinished enterprise with various manifestations. So I generally discount the distinction between modernism and postmodernism. Uh, because postmodernism suggests the end of that modernist thrust into experimentalism of one way or, or another. So early in the modernist era, so I don't call it a period, Dadaists and Surrealists hated the conventions of theater and their illusionistic pretense, but love, spectacle, and public events. And so their provocation and disruption deserted designated theatrical spaces and took the, took the shape of street action or happening in the next generation, the term that Alan Capro, a student of John Cage at Black Mountain College, 
coined in the early 1950s for spontaneous nonlinear provocations deemed art. So he's drawing a distinction between street protest per se, although they have their own theatrical uh, nature, to what he would call what he calls happening, uh, which have something of a shape of, of art to them. Uh, 1954, spontaneous, nonlinear uh, provocations deemed art. For Peter Brook, happenings were part of a holy theater. And he says, he quotes, a uh, happening is a powerful invention. It destroys at one blow many deadly forms, like the dreariness of theater buildings and the charmless trappings of curtain, usherette, cloakroom, program, bar. A happening can be anywhere, anytime, of any duration. Nothing is required, nothing is taboo. A happening may be spontaneous, it may be formal, it may be anarchistic, it can generate intoxicating energy. Behind the happening is the shout, wake up! That's Peter Brook. So, I think that last point that shouting wake up while Brooke is talking about the most experimental forms of theater in the mid 20th century could apply to Ibsen as well. A wake up not only for the characters but for the audience, many of whom themselves would be living the the life of a doll in a doll's house. Amid his calls for, quote, a primitive spontaneity, Eugenio Barba has suggested that, quote, theaters are still antiquated buildings where classical and contemporary texts are recited in routine and conventional style. There is no creative act on stage, only the sterile repetition of worn out formulas and hybrid styles, which try to look modern by exploiting the, the discoveries of other art forms. Uh, Barba at that point is rejecting the whole realistic, naturalistic uh, tradition and the convention that theater, that performance takes place in theaters. Uh, another kind of restriction. These are people who want to blow the walls off of theater, open up uh, the space. Happenings were attempts to break through the conventionality. And in 1963, British publisher John Paul, uh, John Calder, followed up his provocative 1962. Edinburgh Writers Festival with what he deemed the notorious 1963 drama conference to end that year's Edinburgh Festival with a series of happenings. Now, John Calder is a central figure here uh, in Britain. He was one of the major publishers and supporters of Samuel Beckett. He pretty much made the career of William Burroughs. And that 1962 Writers' Convention that I talked about uh, in Edinburgh, and you know the Edinburgh Festival at that time would draw 20, 30,000 people uh, to a conference that introduced William Burroughs to shock everyone during that conference by talking about his method of cutting up literary text creating new literary text by cutting up um, other people's and his own text. Now, you might see that as an extension of Dada, uh, and it is, uh, but it's highly theorized 
uh, Dada. So Calder is an important figure of himself screaming, particularly to the British public, wake up with the kind of uh, narrative that uh, we present, what the subject of narrative can be, and that is drug addiction, homosexuality, other kinds of uh, sexuality, which was an opening up of human experience. The following year, uh, he ran the drama festival in Edinburgh uh, again and closed the show, closed that, the, those performances. And the Edinburgh Festival is still going on, particularly the theater festival. Uh, if you have nothing to do next August, uh, go to Edinburgh uh, and watch all the street theater uh, that's going on there. But Calder introduces these happenings into what, what, a, what pretty much a conventional middle-class intellectual gathering of people. Remember, this is still a jacket and tie era. We have not yet moved into uh, the notion that everyone can wear t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, hoodies uh, to the theater. Uh, you wore jacket and tie and Calder is addressing these people uh, in jackets and, and ties. Many such actions or provocations depended on, involved, and absorbed the response of the gathered as onlookers, spectators, became participants. Audiences thereby enveloped in the event, often played against non-theatrical environments, like the muddy fields of Woodstock or the desert of Burning Bush. For Brooke, the role of the spectator has always been paradoxical. And he says, quote, it is hard to understand the true notion of spectator, there and not there, ignored and yet needed. The actor's work is never for an audience, yet always is for one. The onlooker, the onlooker is a partner who must be forgotten and still constantly kept in mind. A gesture is a statement, expression, communication, and private manifestation of loneliness. It is always what our toe called a signal through the flames. Very famous uh, image by our toe. A signal through the flame. Yet this implies a sharing of experience once contact is made. That's all uh, Brooke, uh, and it is Brooke who is quoting uh, Artaud there. Citing Artaud thus, Brooke sees that, quote, the activity of the actor and the activity of the spectator are driven by the same desperate need. Eugenio Barba goes further, suggesting something of a confrontational relationship with the audience, citing the work of the very firm, famous Polish uh, exper experimental dramatist, uh, Grotowski. This is Barba, he says, quote, new means had to be found to force the spectator into an active collaboration. Grotowski preserves the essence of primitive theater by making the audience participate, but he leaves out the religious element and substitutes secular elements for them. Grotowski uses archetypal images and actions to unleash his attack on the audience. That paradox is also the paradox, at least of theater, if not of modern art. That is, on the one hand, it's appealing to and drawing in the middle class, and then as its primary audience, begins to attack that audience. So the middle class is asked to pay uh, to come to performances <laughs> to see itself attack. That makes life, my theater has some difficulty some days. Anyway, 
The next portion of this talk is called Between Theater and Anthropology. Uh, since one of the bridges is to the source of theater, which Nietzsche lays out as clearly as anyone in, uh, I don't know, 1874 or so, um, with the origins of tragedy. The birth of tragedy from the spirit of music traces the origins of tragedy, at least, back to religious rituals, Dionysian celebration, and musical composition. It's a brilliant book which holds up today. And part of the reason it holds up, like many breakthrough books, it takes expectation and turns it on his head. The expectation had been that Greek drama improved as it moved from Aeschylus to Sophocles to Euripides. Nietzsche turns that backwards and said the high point was uh, Aeschylus and theater would decline in those subsequent uh, periods. So between theater and anthropology. Amid the cultural energy and creative upheaval of 1968, Richard Schechner reconfigured the theatrical experience with his ritual-based adaptation of the Bacchae in what he called Dionysus in 69. He had his own theater called The Performing Garage. Uh, he was a professor at NYU already at that time and had the means to set up his own theater, The Performing Garage. His adaptation followed and built on the anthropological work of Victor Turner and his reassessment of the functionality of rites of passage in pre-industrial cultures and continued the thread developed in performance that is Schechner, continued the thread of performance generated by a group called the Living Theater in New York. These performances in the performance garage famously erase the separation of audience and performers as actors encourage spectators to join in the Dionysian ritual, which gesture challenge the idea of theatrical representation itself. That is, were performers and spectators participating in a communal anthropological experience, or on the other hand, merely playing in or at the uh, sorry, I think someone has the, uh, yeah, could you please mute yourself or Parul, if you could please mute the person. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about this time. Go ahead, please. Um, are what's performed on stage, even in the most avant-garde theatrical traditions, rituals in and of themselves or merely playing at rituals, reproducing rituals? Theoretically, the issue is, are they representations or are they simply real life? The most ardent uh, defenders of an anthropological theater, you know, argue for the validity of these acts like Dionysian rituals, even though they do not grow out of the culture that they were celebrating. So there's an important paradox that exists both for performers, but also theoreticians and students of the avant-garde. Uh, uh, such, such questions arose from studies of performance rituals among indigenous cultures and manifest in contemporary emphasis on what Schechner called actuals. Uh, so Schechner is drifting away from the idea of representation, that these are actually something, and he called them actuals. 
a performance approach explored in laboratory conditions, which Schechner developed at the New York University School of the Arts, an avant-garde incubator in the 1960s, which itself owed much to the field work of cultural anthropologist Victor Turner. In this volume, oh, sorry, uh, Edith Hall herself lays out an alternative, perhaps parallel more psychological tradition and in terms of classical antiquity. That is, is a slightly different take on the avant-garde. Turner is moving uh, to primitive uh, cultures and anthropological uh, studies. Kern says, the one complete surviving dream book, the Greek Artemidorus on interpretation of dreams dating from the third century AD. I bet you thought Sigmund Freud wrote on interpretation of dreams. Uh, here we go to another version in the third century BC. It includes discussion of dreams in which the dreamer has performed as a dancing actor in processions for Dionysus or watched tragedy enacted on stage. Sigmund Freud would not have been surprised by these ancient accounts either, since he was convinced of the affinity between the world of ritual, theater, and dreamscape. In Totem and Taboo, he analyzed ancient rituals as dramatic enactments of myth, emotion, and history. From them, he believed, there emerged the earliest true drama whose mimetic function aimed to restore absent objects in the ceremonial arena. And in Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, uh, which appears in 1900, uh, delayed by the publisher at least a full year at Freud's request, so that the book could mark the new century. He thought it more important that this book come out in 1900 rather than in 1899. So in The Interpretation of Dreams, he proposed a mental image uh, that he proposed that mental images follow dramatic models and embody mimetic representations of lived reality. Freud said that abstract thought becomes conveyed by dreams in a pictorial language. So we have another mode of representation, something closer to hieroglyphics. And if we look here from for connections between ancient art and contemporary avant-garde, which is one thing that we're doing here by looking back at ancient rituals and finding um, performances that will be reflected in contemporary avant-garde. So um, he proposed the mental images follow dramatic models and embody mimetic representations of lived reality. Freud said, the abstract thought becomes conveyed by dreams in pictorial language of dynamic images derived from dramaturgic principles. Outside the academy with emphasis, such emphasis was evident in the anarchic experiments of the living theater, particularly their very famous production of Paradise Now also in 1968. So it paralleled Richard Schechner's uh, Dionysus in 69. Uh, since one of the advantages of living in this marvelously uh, electronic world where I get to talk to people in Calcutta uh, this morning is that much of this material is available online. Uh, there's a great site uh, called Ubu uh, in addition to uh, what's readily available on YouTube and for Burroughs on a site called uh, Reality, Reality Studio. So in many respects, we have much more connection with these ancient 
rituals, uh, particularly their reinterpretations by modernist avant-garde artists, than people would have had uh, a generation ago. Anyway, Paradise Now, also in 1968. And I should say on a personal note, uh, I did see both of those uh, productions, uh, Dionysus in 69. Actually, um, my wife and I were married in 1968. And one of the most interesting gifts, someone gave us tickets to Dionysus in 69. So uh, one of the better uh, wedding gifts and what, one that was not subsequently thrown away. Uh, but we also saw Paradise Now, uh, further impetus to such theatrical revaluation and recalibration was generated by a four-week workshop at NYU. I take this to be a pivotal moment, a four-week workshop at NYU led by Polish theatrical experimenter Jerzy Grotowski. Now, there's a long, complicated story about uh, Grotowski, who developed a kind of theater called poor theater. And that had as much to do with the fact Uh, that Poland, uh, under the Soviet regime, uh, managed to not only maintain its experimental traditions in art, and it's a long history that I'll not go into now, uh, but to develop it and somehow to get it out of Poland and have an impact on the world. One of these tipping points for me like Ibsen's uh, A Doll's House, like uh, Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, is this um, theatrical seminar at New York University, uh, which had a lasting impact on Schechner. So uh, this four-week workshop at New York University led by Polish theatrical experimenter Jerzy Grotowski, still in his theater production phase of their laboratory work. Grotowski was less interested in entertaining people than using theater as a means of theoretical research. And so his theater, he tended to call laboratory theater. Uh, and function to generate new ideas. So he's still in his theater production phase of their laboratory work. Schechner would be the first to publish Grotowski's writing in the United States in what's now called TDR, used to be called Tulane Drama Review when Schechner was at uh, Tulane University, but now TDR means the drama review. Uh, and he, Schechner, actively participated in these exercises that featured what Grotowski called plastique, or free-flowing movement and associated exercise. Laboratory performance here did not mean necessarily putting on a show for audiences, but working through understanding the relation between actors and texts, actors and each other, and the like. So he called them associated exercises. Grotowski concentrated much of his attention on vocal work, Schechner recalled, on identifying and enlivening resonators in various parts of the body. That, that's Schechner. Such a workshop would lead, once international political tensions allowed, particularly 
after the Soviet Union crushed the reforms of what was called the Prague Spring in August of 1968, to the development that is, Grotowski's visit led to the development of what was called, quote, the Laboratory Theater in New York in 1969. In the Poland of the 1960s, painter, assemblage maker, stager of happenings, the set designer and theater director, Tadeusz Kantor, working in Krakow would champion such non-traditional performative mode. Kantor created an innovative visual theater dealing both with the Jewish tradition of Eastern Galicia, including a work called The Dead Class, based on the work of Bruno Schulz, and the experiments of the Parisian avant-garde of the 1930s, creating happenings or what he called living sculptures, one of which panoramic sea happening, for instance, included a section after and so a re-rendering of Jericho's classic painting, The Wrath of Medusa. Very interested, that is, in crossing generic borders, this in the 1930s of Poland. Uh, and one of the things that interests me it was, was the inability of uh, Polish censors, uh, regulators to put an end to such activity uh, because it still managed to draw an audience. Um, he went on to do uh, Rembrandt's uh, The Anatomy Lesson uh, which was shown in Nuremberg and other places. The short New York obituary notes, Mr. Contour was known for creating dynamic, inventive theater based on historical and personal themes. He was present in his production, not as an actor, but sitting on stage watching along with the audience. He used scenery of his own creation. We don't know much about how Shakespeare related to his theatrical performances. We know a lot about the results, the plays he did, uh, but certainly people sat on the stage in Shakespeare's time. Uh, that is, had portable chairs and were part of that. So that was a third seating space. Uh, you had the groundlings who stood, the upper class who sat in the uh, permanent seat, uh, but you also had people on stage, usually the most notable, and actors would have to work around them. Whether or not one of those was Shakespeare, was Shakespeare, we don't know. Uh, but it's hard to imagine he wouldn't sit himself uh, up on stage in the middle of one of his uh, plays. So, I mean, if we're looking at what is contemporary and avant-garde, you almost always can look back and see potential traditions in earlier uh, cultural and artistic manifestations. Anyway, the next part of this is, and it's not bad advice, uh, you must go to Poland. The theater also became more technical, more scientific, even as performance practitioners and theorists developed interest in anthropology and archaeology in search of something like the authentic theatrical experience to discover the roots, the core, the spirit, the soul of that experience. So one direction is theater as entertainment. Another is theater as research. And part of that research, part of that laboratory experience is trying to get at the core of what this experience, this performative experience is all about. What are its roots? Nietzsche had one 
version of, of that. Rehearsal and performing spaces became sites of exploration, developed into theatrical laboratories as performance itself became an experiment. Outside the Anglo-American Western European orbit and behind the Iron Curtain in the small Polish town of Opol, for instance, a Polish performance theorist, Jerzy Gotowski, began his training of actors through which he would move, quote, toward a poor theater, end quote, a theater stripped of all inessentials. And here again, uh, my connections go to people like Samuel Beckett, uh, whose work in the theater was often a matter of exploring how little you needed to make a theatrical experience. So it would cut away all kinds of accepted theatrical conventions. Eugenio Barba also noted of Grotowski, they were trying to build a new aesthetic for the theater and thus to purify the art, to create a modern secular ritual knowing that primitive rituals are the first form of drama, end quote. In 1959, the training and experiment would become a theater laboratory. The company would move finally to another Polish town called Wrocław uh, and reduce its name simply to theater laboratory, rena re renaming itself finally the Institute for research into acting methods. This was not simply actor training as it exists today in most, at least American universities. This was a research-based, psychological, probing, physically demanding sets of exercises. As Robert Finley notes, quote, from its very inception, Grotowski's group was devoted to research and experimentation. While its earliest production seemed fairly conventional by standards later developed by the group, there can be little doubt as to uh, of the intention to found a laboratory dealing with theatrical questions. This was not a company that would produce plays for a general or mass audience. It was a group that would have an eye on its art and the other on the box office? No, rather it would be an artistic laboratory in which experimental research would be conducted. Grotowski would go on to become an international sensation with among other seminal performances, one called Acropolis adopted from the work of the Polish romantic Stanisław Wyszpiansky, the film version of which was introduced by Peter Brook and is one of the few full realizations of the Grotowski's method and approach during the theater production phase of his work, after which he grew increasingly disenchanted with public performance. His last stage work, Apocalypse Plum Figuris, in 1968 was his break from the last vestiges of traditional theater. Uh, that production of uh, Acropolis is available in fuzzy primitive electronic form uh, on YouTube and other uh, sites. I mean, the problem is that it was done with the 1960s uh, technology, um, not current technology, which as you know, uh, your iPhone has as much uh, power as most uh, Hollywood cameras. Uh, and there are any number of uh, Hollywood directors who shoot exclusively on iPhone these days. 
If you want an example, take a look at uh, Sean Baker uh, and a film I like a lot called The Florida Project. Uh, but looking back on some of this 1960s material, uh, you have to put up with some uh, pretty primitive black and white technology. Grotowski would go, go on to become an international sensation with, with among other seminal performers. Oh, I read that. Okay. Uh, the spectacle in, in Grotowski's work, when he did put on something like a play, and this is like, like jazz, you know, in some, certain senses, uh, jazz. Uh, on CD or recorded jazz is a paradox. Uh, since the main feature of jazz is improvisation, uh, what, what you manage to get is one instance in a spectrum of possibilities and makes it seem like this is a definitive version. Uh, it just happens to be the one that was played when someone had a recording device or uh, in a studio. Uh, theater at its best is like that as well. It should never be the same performance production two nights running. How much that varies depends on innumerable things, but Grotowski made it a point to constantly that the work was always a work in progress. Uh, if you follow uh, American Nobel Prize winner uh, Bob Dylan uh, as a poet uh, and a performer, uh, a balladeer, a troubadour, uh, the way he sees himself, um, what is both great and the dismay of many of his fans is that often some of his songs don't sound anything like uh, how they sounded when they were recorded, that he uh, changes those pretty uh, dramatically from performance to performance, and often without telling people. So uh, his, backup, his backup band has to be pretty uh, nimble. So we're dealing here with forms of art that are multiplicities and constantly changing. That doesn't mean that they were moving to some sort of teleological end, which is like the best that it could be, but simply variations, explorations of different features uh, and the like. Which of those might be better than the other is uh, the judgment of critics. Uh, at the time. So Lutovsky is very much in that tradition. And as soon as you start, as Schechner did, inviting audience members on stage to participate in the ritual, you never know what you're going to get. You know, there could be lunatics out there. Uh, there could be, uh, you never know who you're going to in, in, invite up on, on stage. That will have an impact on, on what the audience uh, see. So the version of Dionysus in 69 that I saw is one of hundreds of different versions that may be out there in the ether uh, somewhere. Anyway, Grotowski's spectacle would change and grow as it's often performed over a 10 year period and would act as something of a bridge to or a catalyst for Grotowski's subsequent move from a theater of productions to what he called paratheatrical activity, the so-called exit from theater in his seminal meditation on theater, The Empty Space. Peter Brook would declare that Grotowski's holy theater, quote, is, close, is as close as anyone has got to Artaud's ideal. It's a complete way of life for all its members. And so it is in contrast to all other avant-garde and experimental groups whose work is scrambled and usually invalidated through lack of means. 
poverty is their complaint and excuse. Grotowski makes poverty an ideal. His actors have, have given up everything except their own body. No wonder they feel they are the richest theater in the world. Brooke would go on to reprise his comments on Grotowski as a preface to Grotowski's collective writings called Towards a Poor Theater, where he emphasizes in Brooke that Grotowski calls his theater a laboratory. It is. It is a center of research. It is perhaps the only avant-garde theater whose poverty is not a drawback where shortage of money is not an excuse for inadequate means, which automatically undermine the experiment. In Grotowski's theater, as in all true laboratories, the experiments are scientifically valid because the essential conditions are observed. In the theater, there is absolute concentration by a small group and unlimited time. So if you are interested in his findings, you must go to Poland. Or else, this is still Brooke, do what we did. Bring Grotowski here. And not only the Schechner bring Grotowski to NYU, Peter Brook brings him to the RSC, to the Royal Shakespeare uh, Company and the uh, Stratford uh, Studios. So Grotowski then has a major impact on Peter Brook's early uh, re-renderings of Shakespeare. The most famous may be the very gymnastic uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which is also available on, on YouTube. But you've got people flying all over the stage like uh, acrobats and uh, on uh, swings and things of that nature. It is very much Grotowski's body-centered avant-gardeism. In Anthony Nartot, The Theater and Its Double of 1938, but remember, it's not translated into English until 1958, one of the major breakthroughs of Grove Press in the United States was bringing out that work. The poet, former surrealist and theatrical provocateur would insist that, quote, instead of relying on text as definitive or as sacred, we must first of all put an end to the subjugation of the theater to the text and rediscover the notion of a kind of unique language halfway between gesture and thought. We remember that Ezra Pound very famously said that theater is not language. It is people moving around on stage using language. So that language becomes a secondary mode, uh, the imagistic, the pictorial, the hieroglyphic, is the language of theater. And Artaud laid that out in 1938. Uh, Grotowski's Toward a Poor Theater too would become in that Artaudian spirit, something of a seminal text for Western theatrical practitioners and theorists alike even as it was not published in Grotowski's homeland until after his death. Brooke would adopt much of Grotowski's terminology and adapt his training exercises for his own laboratory experiments of the 1960s. In collaboration with Charles Morowitz, he established something of a Grotowski approach to British theater. They worked through the Royal Shakespeare Experimental Group to develop in 1964 a theater of cruelty season at the Lambda Theater Club, which drew upon and modified theories from Grotowski 
and Artaud. Brooke himself would finally break from the Royal Shakespeare Company and move toward fuller anthropological, anthrop anthropology based performance research in the Glotowski Manor, leaving behind the legacy established with such production as his acrobatic A Midsummer Night's Dream of 1970, soon after he left for France to establish the International Center for Theater Research with occasional returns to RSC. I'm talking about uh, Peter Brook as if he were a historical figure. Uh, in his 90s, he's still at work, still turning out uh, performances and still based in Paris. So he founded the International Center for Theater Research, where Brooke could more fully explore the textual body in performing, developed through the gymnastic exercises and rehearsal for A Midsummer Night's Dream. Commenting on Grotowski's approach, Brooke says of those RSC days, and this is Brooke. We know in theory that every actor must put his art into question daily, like pianists, dancers, painters, and that if he doesn't, he will almost certainly get stuck, develop cliches, and eventually decline. We recognize this and yet can do so little about it that we endlessly chase after new blood after youthful vitality, except for certain of the most gifted exceptions, who will, of course, get all the best chances, absorb most of the available time. The Stratford studio was a recognition of this problem, but it continually ran up against the strains of a repertory, of an overworked company, of simple fatigue. Lutovsky's work, this is still Brooke, Lutovsky's work was a reminder that what he achieves almost miraculously with a handful of actors is needed to the same extent by each individual in our two giant companies in two theaters 90 miles apart. The official Grotowski Institute celebrates the relation between these exceptional directors, that is Brook and Grotowski, as follows. Since the mid 1960s, has consistently supported that is Brooke has consistently supported the theatrical activities of Yedrzej Grotowski, inviting him to collaborate and visit the theaters Brooke has run, while also using his standing to assist Grotowski in difficult periods. Those were mostly political in the 1980s. Brooke is among one of the most outstanding and most distinguished commentators of Grotowski's work and writings, as shown, for example, the extended section of The Empty Space dedicated to the work of Grotowski, or his forward to Grotowski's book, Toward the Poor Theater, where Brooke was the first to employ the concept of art as vehicle, which Grotowski adopted in later years as a description of the final phase of his work. As Brooke observed in an essay of that title, that is art as vehicle. It seems to me that Grotowski is showing us something which existed in the past, but has been forgotten over the centuries. That is that one of the vehicles which allows man, sorry, people, man to have access to another level of perception is to be found in the art of performance. Okay, I see I've exceeded my uh, hours uh, time. Uh, if we had more time and I had more energy, I would go into one example, uh, which I deal with in detail, that I recommend to you, which is not a theater performance, but a film called My Dinner with Andre. Uh, and in the great Beckett tradition, it's a film in which nothing happens. If we look at the idea 
of theater of the everyday, two characters, both playwrights, one a director, meet in a restaurant and have dinner. When they're done, the film ends. Not, not exactly an action-packed uh, thriller. But much of the discussion is Andre Gregory's discussion of his own theatrical work, his relationship to Grotowski, and how he performed in Grotowski's next theatrical enterprise, which were these paratheatrical exercises that often lasted all night with ordinary village people with no script and no direction. So <clears throat> I've been talking about certain shifts in theater toward the everyday, toward the common, and toward experimentalism as a means of research, a means of understanding the genre and the artist. And the artist here we're talking about is the actor. Um, you can probably follow this theme through yourself. It has corollaries in narrative, it has corollaries in uh, poetry uh, as well. But I think the most dynamic avant-garde traditions over most of the 20th century into the 21st century that I would call now late modernism rather than postmodernism uh, grow out of this tradition, at least going back to Ibsen. This gives me the opportunity to thank you once more. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for making it so early in the morning. Anyway, it was it was wonderful to to listen to you, and it was wonderful to go through this this history of experimental theater the way you did. And I'm sure our students and everyone else who has joined would have learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time again, Stan, and looking forward to meeting you soon, digitally as well as actually. Bye bye. <laughs>